Hello again and welcome back to English Today. And this is DVD 15 and the third DVD of your upper intermediate level. And in this DVD, we'll begin with another two episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by our special TV programs where we'll be talking about the option of working in retirement. And then our sports expert will tell us about sumo wrestling, fat and fast. Then in the grammar section, we'll learn how to use a grammatical form called the causative have, and also how to construct the past perfect tense. All right, so happy viewing. Anyone home? Anne, it's great to see you. Hi. Oh, you look great. Oh, thank you, Paula. You look um, you look well yourself. Uh, and this house is so untidy and and so dusty. I know. Let's give this place a good clean. The others will be here in a minute. Let's get started straight away. Before you know it, we'll have cleaned and tidied everything. <laughs> you haven't changed, Anne. Cleaning, dusting, tidying. It's just like when we were at university. Can't you think of anything else? Oh, look who's talking. Always strumming away on your guitar. Come on, Paolo. Don't be lazy. Oh. Come on, let's get started. Surprise, surprise! Oh, Michelle! Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Hi. Good. Hi. Sandra. Hi. Wow. Yes, Wonderful. All together again, just like the old days. Okay, guys, what shall we do? I want to have lots of fun. So do I. Come on, Michelle, let's go for a long walk all the way down to the lake. Stop where you are. Where are you two going? Come on, Paolo, pick up that brush again. And Michelle, please, can you pick up your bag and, and that frightful hat? Joe, come on, Captain. Come on, Michelle, stop playing around and give us a hand. Oh. Oh, this detergent is made by Syntex, the American multinational that makes household cleaning products. I refuse to use this product. You know I hate multinationals. But it's just all detergents are made by multinationals. How are you supposed to clean a house if you refuse to use them? You guessed right. I never do any cleaning. My flatmates look after that. Oh, I see. So you arrange to have your flat cleaned. Mm, Michelle, you're just like Paolo. Look what a mess this house is in. If it weren't for us. If it weren't for you, I'd be chilled out playing my guitar. None of your forced labor. I see. We spend most of the time of this holiday cleaning. And I'm starting to wonder if this holiday may have been a mistake. Oh, come on, Paolo. Stop complaining. You'll be happy to see this place all spick and span. Sandra, I've, I've already dusted that. Oh, really? Yes. Are you sure you cleaned it properly? Because it doesn't look very clean to me. What's going on here? Are you my old college friends or workers from a cleaning company? <laughs> Come on, put away those brooms and detergents and let's toast the good old days. But Sarah's not here yet. That's odd. She should be here by now. She said she'd be here just after lunch. That's right. And she's the one who organized this reunion. Am I wrong, or are you talking about me? Oh, Sarah, at last! Oh, don't get up. So, everybody ready for the toast? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, 
I'm really tired. I need to lie down. Oh, Sarah, don't be a spoiled sport. We have been waiting for you. Come on, ladies! Wow, Anne's looking more beautiful than ever. Don't tell me I still think about her. So, uh, I propose a toast yeah. to our college days together. Yes. Hmm? And to this wonderful holiday. That's right. Cheers! Cheers! Cheers. Hi again, and welcome back to your live TV program to learn some more English language. Now, in that last episode, Anne was quite surprised that Michelle doesn't clean her flat herself. In fact, she said, she said, I see. So you arrange to have your flat cleaned, to have your flat clean. Now, that means that somebody else cleans the flat for Michelle. This is very interesting. Well, in fact, that's what I do too. I don't clean my flat myself. Somebody cleans it for me. So I have my flat cleaned every two weeks. Now, this is an interesting grammatical form because we use it when we talk about services. We talk about other people who offer us services. Let me give you another example. Hair. I don't cut my hair myself. It's too difficult. I can't do the back. So I go to the hairdressers, and that's a service. So I go to the hairdressers, and they cut my hair. And I say, every month, I have my hair cut. So that is a grammatical form using the verb have, which describes services. Some, somebody does something for you. And we can use it, for example, with the hairdresser, with the mechanic. For example, if your car breaks down, usually you go to a mechanic. With cleaners, with the dentist, things like this. So, services. So, I'd like to go to the screen now and show you how this works grammatically because it's very different to other languages. And we're using the verb have. That's why it's called the causative have. Causative in the sense that it causes things to happen. All right? Let's look at the form. Have something done. So, in the present tense, you can say, every month, I have my hair cut. Now, notice the verb have is in the present form because we can use this grammatical form in any tense. So, we start with the verb have, then we have the object. That's important. I have my hair and then the past participle. Okay, the object is in the middle. So, every month I have my hair cut. Another example, every year I have, what? My teeth, past participle, checked. Okay, I have my teeth checked. Every year I have my kitchen painted. You see? And every three months, I have my car serviced. So I go to the mechanic and I have my car serviced. So be careful because it's terribly important to put the object between the verb have and the past participle. I have my car serviced. Okay? Now, let's move on to the past tense because, as I said, you can use this form in any tense, past, present, future. So, examples. Last week, I had my eyes tested. So, the opticians, that's a service. I had my eyes tested. Yesterday, I had my photograph taken. Often, when you need to renew your passport, for example. Last week, I had my dress dry cleaned. Again, that's another service. You don't do it yourself. Somebody does it for you. Okay? So, the verb have goes into the past. I had something done. 
And now let's look at the future. Tomorrow, I'm going to have. So here the verb have goes into the future, expressing an intention. So we have, I'm going to have my scooter repaired. All right, object in the middle. Next week, I'm going to have my hair colored. And next week, I'm going to have my passport renewed. All right, so the causative have. Very, very useful. And you don't find this in other languages. So you need to practice it. And remember, first the verb have, then the object, and then the past participle. All right? So that's the causative have, and I think you'll find it very useful. All right? Great. So see you again in the next lesson for some more language. Bye. Life's hard for musicians, you know, Mike? Sample recordings, auditions, the odd performance, but never anything serious. Always waiting for the big break. You know, Paolo, I think no one has understood your talent yet. You'll see. You'll be successful one day. I certainly hope so. I need to make money somehow. Why don't you get a job? Something until you make it as a guitarist. What would I do? Working in a bank like you? No, that's not for me. It's not as if there are only banks to work in. There are other jobs you could do. I know, I know. I worked in a supermarket last year. What was that like? Oh, well, uh, I didn't go up all the time. And the alarm clock at dawn. I did it for three months. Oh, no. Normal jobs are not for me. I am an artist. What are you talking about? About work. Oh, by the way, Sarah, how, how's your pub coming on? Just a minute, what was it called? Blue Moon? That's it. You do it on purpose, don't you? Making things worse. With that sarcastic tone of voice. You like making fun of me. You're horrible! But what did I say? What? Didn't you know? Sarah's pub burned it down two years ago. The insurance hasn't paid. They say the fire wasn't an accident. Sarah lost everything, including the sense of fun she used to have. Man, I really messed up. I didn't know that had happened. We, we spoke at Christmas, but she didn't say the pub burned down. You don't know what Sarah's like. She doesn't like to speak this thing. This experience has really changed her. And I think this holiday will be good for her. What's going on? Just taste no, less. that's enough, Sandra. I don't think you need to add any more salt. I really think the ravioli are rather tasteless. Well, let's see what they think. Would you like to try my ravioli? Yeah. Sandra says they're tasteless. Sure. Mm. Mm, fantastic, huh? Mm. Mmm, really good. Hmm? I always said you'd make someone a great wife. See? Mm. I don't Did think... you hear that? I don't think they're very tasty. I'm sorry, Anne, but my ravioli are a lot better than yours. I'm cooking tomorrow, and we'll see who's the best cook. Oh, she's always criticizing. Oh, uh, don't take it seriously, Anne. You know what Santa's like. Mm. Competitive by nature. Oh, what? <laughs> Okay, guys, let's have a chat. Tell me what you've been doing since we last met. Well, Paolo and I were talking about our work and our hopes for the future. Work, work, work. Let's talk about something a bit more interesting. Romances, passionate love story, things like that. Oh, you, for example, Anne. Have you got a boyfriend? Me? Well, why me? I... I've got to go to the kitchen to check on the roast. I have oh, come on, Anne. Don't be shy. 
answer Michelle's question. Okay. <laughs> well, there is someone. <laughs> but he's not my boyfriend. Oh. What does that mean? He's my flatmate. His name's Jack. And he's going out with a friend of mine called Sharon. Oh. But I still hope I have a chance. I really do like him. And I think about him all the time. Are, are you in love? Maybe. Yes. Yes, I think I am. <laughs> wow. I adore passion and tormented love stories. <laughs> Um, I've really got to go now and check on the roast. It'll be burning. Uh, Michelle, can you come and give me a hand? And then come and tell the others that dinner's ready. All right. Mike? Mikey? Hello? Anyone there? Yes, what's wrong? Oh, you tell me. You look as if... Uh... I'm finished, Paolo. I wasn't expecting this. I thought that... I'm stupid. What are you talking about? What do you mean? Anne, she's in love with another man. Huh. And I was hoping that, you know, we could become more than just good friends during this holiday. I've never stopped thinking about her. What an idiot. Sorry, Paulo, I have to be by myself for a while. No, but... Beautiful girl with brown eyes Oh, dusting, dust, dusting up, dusting away my heart sighs, 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 sighs. My heart sighs. Oh, yeah, no bad. Inspiration at last. Oh, thanks, Mike. You are a great friend. Hello again to you and welcome back. In that last episode, Sarah was in a bad mood. There's always a reason why somebody's in a bad mood, and she had a good reason. Do you remember what happened? Yeah? I'll read it to you so you do remember, because it's useful for us. It introduces a new grammatical form, which I want to teach you. Paolo said, when she arrived, the place had burnt down. Now, can you imagine Sarah goes to her pub and it's burnt? So he says, when she arrived, the place had burnt down. Now, this had burnt down is what I want to teach you. It's the past perfect. Let me give you another example because we use it when you have two actions. One action happens after the other. Let me show you. For example, I write a message and then I send it. Okay. Now these are two actions. First you write it and then you send it. So I could begin the phrase, put the two actions together and they become consecutive. And we begin the phrase with after. So I could say after I had written, this is the first action, further in the past, after I had written the message, doom, I sent it. The second phrase is in the simple past. So this is what I'd like to look at with you on the screen now, the past perfect, for two actions which happen at different times in the past. Now if you look at the examples, the first one is, after I had checked my change, I left the shop. All right, so first I check my change. Have I got enough change? Is it correct? And then I leave the shop. You put them together and the first action goes further back in the past. Now, you can see how it's formed. We have 
the auxiliary have in the past, not in the present. And that takes everything further back. So, after I had checked, checked is the past participle, my change, I left simple past the shop. Okay, so then we get the idea that one action is further in the past. Another example, I read the contract, then I sign it. It becomes, when I had read the contract, I signed it. All right, so past perfect. This is important for you because we also use it in the third conditional, which we will be studying. Okay, another example, you get in your car, you fasten your seatbelt, you drive off, all right? So, after I had fastened, past participle, my seatbelt, I drove off. And one more example, when I had tried the shoes on, I bought them. So I try them on, I buy them. When I had tried the shoes on, I bought them. A few more, they'll help you, you'll get the hang of it. After I had checked my ticket, I went to the airport. So first I check my ticket, then I go to the airport. And the last one, I read the instructions. I have a new machine, so I read the instructions and then I turn it on. So after I had read the instructions, I turned the machine on. All right, so that is a new tense, it's called the past perfect, and it's formed by putting the auxiliary have in the past tense, followed by the past participle. And this is actually very similar in many other languages. So I don't think it's going to cause any particular problems for you. All right? And we'll look at that again in the conditional form, conditional number three. Great. So have fun and take care. Bye. Good evening, and welcome to this week's edition of Let's Talk. In the studio with me, as always, are our commentators, Marie and Tom. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'd like to start our discussion this evening with some personal questions. How old are you? Are you nearing retirement? Are you already retired? Perhaps you have your working life ahead of you. Anyway, one thing is for sure. The meaning of the word retirement is going to change in the future. Let's talk about this with Tom and Marie. You're right, Eric. Uh, the traditional division of uh, life into three cycles, uh, education, employment, and retirement, must change. People in developed countries are living longer. By 2025, in developed countries, the share of the population over 60 will have reached 26 percent. All these pensioners will certainly wield a lot of power. They will, Eric. But you know, experts are beginning to talk about the concept of active aging. Just think that by 2050, the average lifespan in developed countries will be in the mid-80s. And this increasing longevity is already starting to have a negative impact on public finances, economic growth and general living standards. The, the problem is that there is increasing pressure on social security systems and public funds for retirement and health care expenses. Uh, economists are increasingly questioning the sustainability of the European social model with its high welfare standards. So, how can we solve this problem? Well, uh, governments really must encourage older people to continue working. There should oh, be... Oh, just a minute, Mary. Sorry to interrupt, but... Are you really saying that I will have to work until I'm 95? <laughs> well, not until 95, perhaps. <laughs> but as I was saying, there should be programs for lifelong learning to help people learn up-to-date job skills as they get older. People about to retire should plan ahead and find some way of working, maybe a part-time job. Well, uh, some American companies already have 
phased retirement programs. Now, how do they work? Well, uh, retired employees go to the company website where they can find project work for the company. Uh, this may last two days or two months. And the retired workers can manage their own time and work when and where they want. Uh, if they need some training to do the job, they can go to the company website and take a short course using the internet to learn what they have to do. In this way, retired people have more money and the companies can use the skills of their retired workers. Yes, more money but less free time. I don't think I like the idea of having to work in my retirement. And you, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think about this? Well, thank you to our commentators, Tom and Marie, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And goodbye to you, and see you again next week for another edition of Let's Talk. Well, today's discussion was about how retirement will change. Retirement is when people stop working. The retirement age in European countries is around 60. We say a person retires. To retire means to stop working. And a person who is retired is a person who has stopped working. They are called pensioners. A pensioner is a retired person who receives weekly or monthly payments from the state. The money a pensioner receives is called a pension. So why and how will things change in the future? The average lifespan is increasing. A lifespan is the length of a life. So people are living longer. We call this longevity. This increasing longevity is having a negative impact on public finances and living standards. Public finances are the money a government has to spend its, on its services. And living standards are what we call the general level of life in economic terms. There is more pressure on social security systems in Europe. A social security system of a country is the system of a country has to support the members of its society. For example, sick, unemployed, or retired people. Economists, these are economic experts, question the sustainability of the European social model. That is, the social security systems of European countries. The sustainability means the ability to continue doing something. Because welfare standards in Europe are high, welfare is the economic assistance a government provides for people in need. So, people need to plan ahead. A plan ahead is a phrasal verb. That means to make plans about something that will happen in the future. Well, that's all for me. Take care, and I'll see you next week for another edition of Let's Talk. Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's edition of Sports Special. With me in the studio is John Forbes, our sports expert. Hello, Eric, and good afternoon to all our sports fans. Well, John, which sports are you going to talk about today? I'd like to talk about sumo. Interesting. I must say, I know something about the martial arts, karate and judo, but sumo? I know almost nothing. Those enormous guys, their unusual hairstyles, their colorful and rather unusual clothes. So, please tell us more. Well, Eric, you know sumo is a martial art, too and it's Japan's traditional national sport. In fact, it's one of the world's oldest sports. It was first mentioned in a Japanese book more than a thousand years ago, but experts believe it might be much older. Really? More than a thousand years old? Yes, and you know there are also ancient wall paintings showing the sport. Archaeologists think prehistoric man may have done sumo as a form of prayer to the gods, for a good harvest. Hmm. I think most people in the West watch these enormous wrestlers without appreciating these ancient traditions. That's right, Eric. Sumo isn't just a sport. It's more a way of life, and it's played an important role in Japan's cultural and religious history. In Japan, successful sumo wrestlers are looked up to as role models and heroes by many people. Um, how does a sumo match work? Two men meet in a ring that is about four and a half meters across. 
The aim of the game is to force your opponent out of the ring or make a part of his body, apart from the soles of his feet, touch the floor. A bout can last just a few seconds or as long as three minutes. Sumo wrestlers are very big, but they can move very quickly. Do you think I could be a sumo wrestler? <laughs> well, if you put on 100 kilos, maybe yes. Sumo wrestlers start their training when they're young boys. If they show promise, they go to live in a traditional Japanese house called a sumo stable. The young boys train a lot and look after the older wrestlers. They prepare their food and clean their rooms for them. Everyone in the sumo stable eats a lot. They eat lots of noodles, rice, fish and chicken. The traditional dish is called chankanobi and it's made with fish, meat and vegetables. The wrestlers eat this with lots of rice and they drink lots of beer too. Then they go to sleep. So, that's how they put on so much weight. Yes, the secret is to eat a lot and then sleep. This helps the wrestlers put on weight. And the wrestlers' hairstyles, where do they come from? A good question, Eric. There are lots of different ranks for sumo wrestlers. The best wrestlers are in the top rank. The style of a wrestler's hair depends on his rank. All the hairstyles come from samurai traditions. Samurai were traditional soldiers in Japan. Interesting. I guess it's difficult for a sumo wrestler to find a girlfriend? Actually, it's not that difficult, Eric. Successful wrestlers usually go out with beautiful models or pop singers. Hmm. Where can you see tournaments in Japan? There are six grand sumo tournaments called Basho every year. They take place during odd-numbered months like March or July. The Basho take place in Tokyo and Osaka, Nagoya and Fukuoka. Thanks, John, for a fascinating explanation of these rather mystifying sport. We found out a lot about sumo. Thanks, John. Goodbye. And goodbye to all our sports fans. See you next week for another edition of Sports Special. So, today we found out about a martial art called sumo. A martial art is an art of self-defense without using weapons, just your body. To find out about something means to learn new information. We found out that in Japan, sumo is more than just a sport, it's a way of life. People look up to sumo wrestlers, they are heroes. To look up to someone means to respect and admire them. A sumo wrestler is a man who practices sumo. Sumo wrestlers are very fat and they have particular hairstyles. We found out that their hairstyle depends on their rank. Notice how we say depends on something. A rank is a position on a scale. The best wrestlers are in the top rank. And I was surprised to find out that sumo wrestlers go out with beautiful girls. To go out with someone means to have a romantic relationship with someone. What about you, ladies? Would you go out with a sumo wrestler? And you guys, would you put on a hundred kilos to become a sumo wrestler? We say put on weight. This means become fatter. Actually, to put on so much weight, sumo wrestlers start training very young. If a boy shows promise, this means he shows ability at the sport. And what is the aim of the game? The aim is the objective. In football, the aim is to score a goal. In sumo, the aim is to force the opponent out of the ring. The opponent is the other person playing. The ring is the square platform where wrestlers and boxers fight. A wrestling or boxing match is called a bout. Sumo tournaments take place in odd number months. An odd number is a number that isn't divisible by two. For example, one, three, five, seven. Two, four, six, eight are even numbers. An even number can be divided by two. I have to leave you now, but see you here next week for another edition of Sports Special.